Okay. Welcome to this talk about ClojureScript, the very last session on NSE to 2021. So thank you for showing up and for tuning in if you're tuning in online. So um, this talk will be, uh, I will show you uh, the ClojureScript programming language and what it's like developing with it. So it's a, the ClojureScript is a functional programming language that compiles to JavaScript. And it has a bunch of really excellent tools for front-end web development. And it has a quite unique development, um, development environment that's very, dy uh, very dynamic and interactive. And the goal of this talk is to show you what it's like working with us. So I don't have any slides. I just have my text editor that you see on screen now. So I'll be writing some code, trying to explain some basic features of the language and show you the tools that you have available to work with. Yes, uh, my name is Christian Johansson. I work for uh, Kudemaker, this is a, a consultancy here in town. And for the past four years, I've worked full-time with ClojureScript and Clojure. And then I've done a lot of ClojureScript also prior to that, all the way back to 2013. So let's get started. So. I'll start by just taking a quick look at the language. And the best way to introduce the language, I find, is to look at its data structures. So it compiles to JavaScript, and it runs in a JavaScript environment. And so it uses, it uses JavaScript where it can. So numbers in ClojureScript are JavaScript numbers. There's nothing special about them. Uh, same thing with strings. Strings are also just JavaScript strings. Uh, things start to look different when you want to call functions. So in, like in JavaScript, you could imagine doing something like this. You call inc to increment the number. And in ClojureScript, this looks very different because the parentheses goes from the beginning. And ClojureScript actually does this for a very, very good reason that I will explain shortly. But I can evaluate this. So anytime you see this on the screen, um, the arrow pointing, that's me eval evaluating the code and getting an answer back. So inc increments the number by one. Cool. I can call functions on strings as well. Um, so let's see, we can do uh, repeat three. And if I evaluate that, I get a list of three strings repeated one after another. OK. There are more data types here. You have Booleans, of course. And then we have. Um, this thing here, which looks like a JavaScript array, except it's a, called a vector in ClojureScript. But it works the same way. It's an indexed data structure. You can add things to the end of it. And then we, of course, saw, let me just copy this one. We saw this other kind of list that we got before. And you have sets, which are unordered sets of uh, collections of items that enforces unique entries inside. And then I will show you two more things. So this thing here is called a keyword. And a keyword is much like a string, except you would use it typically in technical context. So if you want to use it for a key in a map, uh, wherever you use strings in your code, basically in Clojure, you use uh, keywords instead. So let's make a map then. This is a map, has key value pairs. And you typically use, you can use strings for, you can use any value for keys and maps, but typically you use keywords. So these are roughly most of the data types that this language has for you to work with. And there are a few interesting things that we need to discuss here before we move on. And the first one is that all of these data types are immutable, which means that they cannot change. So we already know this is true from strings, right? So if I have a, uh, a string here, and I call to lowercase on it, then that gives me a new string. It doesn't ruin my old string, right? The old one is still the uppercase string, and the new one is the, the lowercase strings. So ClojureScript does the same for all these data types. So if I call this um, structure here numbers, I have the numbers, and I can do conj, which um, adds to the end of the list. Now I have a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but the old list still only has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this en enables us to write functional code. Uh, all of these data types are immutable. OK, very good. Another thing that's interesting is that 
if you take a look at this list here, this has the exact same appearance as the function call that created it, right? And the reason for this is that ClojureScript code, which this is, is ClojureScript data. So the language is built up of its own data structures. And in fact, all the syntax in the language, or roughly all of it, maybe 95%, are already covered on this slide. This is all the syntax the language has. It just uses these data types in different orderings to create other structures. So if I want to do an if, that's a parenthesis, it's a list. And then the, you have an expression here. And then you have the true part and the false part. And what about this one? Is that an operator? No, it's not an operator. It's a function. So anything that typically in other languages are operators are functions. OK. But how come this is a function call and this is data? Well, that just uh, uh, it's up to how you evaluate it. So when you evaluate it in the context of a program, ClojureScript expects the first thing in the list to be a function that it calls with the other arguments. So if I try to evaluate this one, I get the list. But if I evaluate this one, I get an error because strings are not functions, so I can't call it. But if I put a quotation mark in front of it, I can evaluate it as literal data. And you can do the same thing with code. So now I just get a list back with a symbol, a number, and a string. And you can, you can even manipulate the code as if it were data. So I could say filter uh, number, and then I get back all the pieces of code that was a number. This is pretty cool. And this is what you use to create macros, which is code that generates code. I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but it's an interesting aspect of the language. A more practical aspect of this is that because all the code is data, we can approach it when we uh, work with it in a little bit different manner. So I'll show you this by creating a function. I'll call it magnify. And it's going to magnify a number in some undef undefined manner. OK, so I can call this now this way, and it doubles the number. So again, we have just a bunch of data. So you can look at the code as a tree, basically. And my editor can then use uh, structural commands to navigate the code. So now I can, if I hit down, I go into the list. And I can go forward, 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 or back, and then down again to go into this list. And you can really think about your code in a much more structured manner than you are probably used to. And if I go up, up, I get back up to the top. So that's navigation, but editing is even more interesting. So let's say that I want to treat negative numbers differently. Well, I will have, need to have an if. And then I say, if it's positive, oh, sorry. If it's positive, now I want this thing to be my if part and something else to be the else part. I could copy it and move it to the right place, or I could just use the command slurp which moves the next expression into the one I'm inside. And then we could have a separate case for negative numbers. This is obviously just a silly function. Um, yeah, there we go. And then maybe I regret this, and I just want, I only need this in my implementation. And then I can perform the command raise, which makes this expression take the place of its surrounding expression, right? So it's inside an expression, and I lift it up. And this is actually very, very useful when you edit code. So in this mode of editing, it's also impossible to delete characters that would unbalance your tree. So I, this, I'm hitting backspace here now. I cannot delete these parentheses because it does not make any sense. I can only delete them when I delete the entire expression. OK. So I've been evaluating this and running this. And I said that ClojureScript compiles to JavaScript. So where is this running? It needs to run in a JavaScript environment, right? Well, right now it's running inside Emacs, but Emacs is talking to the outside world to make this happen. So let's see. If I do JS slash, I can access the JavaScript global namespace. So anything that's available in JavaScript um, is available under JS slash. So if I type alert, I can say hello. And now Firefox starts jumping because there's an alert box over in my browser here. And you can even see my exception from before over in the DevTools here. So this is the browser that's running my code. 
And this browser we will work with for the rest of this presentation. So let me just do this. Is, is it readable? Fonts? Not the browser. Not the browser. Uh, yeah. yeah, cool. OK. So <clears throat> we have the browser, and we have a live environment inside our editor. Let's start to build something. So the code that we did before, I'm going to stick inside something called a comment, which looks like this. And what this does is that it allows me to keep the code here if I want to evaluate it to test things out. But when Clojure compiles this file, it's just going to remove the whole thing. So if you load this file in the browser, nothing's going to happen. But I have it available to play around with if I want to test functions in my namespace or whatever. So we'll just keep that here. And now to render something on screen, I will pull down a library uh, which is called DumDum. And DumDum is a component library that works similar to how React works. You can define uh, components that define the markup of your page, and the library makes sure that the DOM has the same structure. And it does so in an efficient manner. And because ClojureScript has immutable data structures, it can really make that diffing operation very efficiently. So uh, DumDom, um, by the way, I don't don't know if you can see the bottom of my screen, but towards the bottom here, I get uh, you see the, uh, the signature of the function to help me work with it. So the render takes a component and an element to put it inside of. So the element I can get, because I prepared it before this talk, so it's called uh, get element by ID app. And to make sure that I remember correctly, I can evaluate this. And yes, that's a div element. And then uh, the smallest component I can make looks like this. So if I evaluate this now, I get some text on screen over here. So what's this? Again, this is just Clojure Script data, right? It's just a vector with a keyword and a string. So it's all data. The code is data, the markup is data, everything's data. Uh, in the Clojure and Clojure Script community, this kind of data is colloquially referred to as hiccup. But it's really just vectors with keywords and strings inside. If I put a dot, I can add a class name to it, which will trigger uh, my pre-made CSS, which makes the text a little bit bigger. Uh, you can add attributes, style, color, red, and then it turns red. OK. So I'm going to now uh, try to build something a little bit bigger. So we need to have uh, some data. And then we need to have, um, I need to put this in a function. OK, uh, render, it will take some data in. And we'll take a look at this later. OK, so our data. So <laughs> um, I pre <laughs> prepared a small example to build. And then I figured uh, the most common example to build is like a to-do list. And I figured I'm going to in. Uh, be very creative, so I created a shopping list instead. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I could have chosen something uh, more fun, I guess, but I wanted an example that is uh, CRUD-like, uh, manipulative data, because it's similar to what we you typically do in our day jobs. So that's why I chose that. Anyway, so I'll define a store. The store is my global storage of data in the whole application that I'll have in the browser. And in my first attempt, it's going to be a map. And inside, I will have a shopping list. Let's just imagine that we navigated to a specific list. And uh, it will be for a specific week, and it will have some groceries on it, uh, which is a vector of items of, yeah, I'll just say text. Um, text uh, orange. And then, of course, we also need to have a COVID-19 test. Now, because this map is immutable, it's not very suited for the global storage because I, I can't update it, right? So my global storage needs to be something that can update. So typically what we do is that we wrap this in something called an atom. And an atom is like an object that only stores one, one value. So typically you take an immutable value and store it in an atom, 
and then you can exchange the value over time. But the advantage of, of this process is that 95% of my code will see this immutable value inside and will be functional call working on immutable values. And then just the very top layer will know anything about this mutable atom that's on top. And then finally, I'm going to change from a def to a def once, because when the browser reloads my code, I don't want to reload the data. So that's my data. And then um, we can take a look at the, uh, so I'm going to call this machinery. So I'm going to have a few pieces of code here that would naturally go in different files in production. I'm just going to annotate them with comments and keep them in the same place for now. So. We need UI components. So now we are going to, uh, so previously I created some hiccup markup just in line in the render call. Now I want to create a reusable component. And oh, to do that, we're going to prefer something called a def component, which just allows me to define a component that I can use over and over again. So we'll call it list page component and it will receive some kind of data, and I'll move this markup into the component here. And then inside the render function, we'll call this component with the data that's being passed to render. And then finally, I'll have a small boot up section to the bottom here, where we call the render once with the contents of the store. So this at picks out the map that's inside the store. And then I can add a watch to the store that will call this function every time the contents change. So I don't really have time to explain all the arguments, all the, all the details of this, but uh, so this is a subscription for changes to the store, and it will call render as well. So with that, I have my little world up and going. So no changes on the screen because the component still just does uh, static data. So let's use some of the data we're getting in here to render. Now, inside this component, this is a UI component. I don't really want the UI component to be talking about shopping lists and groceries and weeks. I would ra much rather it just said uh, title. And then someone else is going to have to prepare that for me. So the reason for this I will explain in a little moment. But for now, I'm going to put a function that is called prepare UI data that we will create. Um, and its job is to not be machinery, but to be something much more important. This is our business logic. So the business logic is responsible for taking our business domain data and turning it into UI data. So by making this very clear separation, I can have all my important testable logic in just pure functions that take immutable data in and return immutable data out. And this way, I can write lots of tests for the important bits, and I don't have to write tests that trigger the UI specifically. I'll show another way to test the UI specifically in a little bit. Anyway, it's going to generate a title that's just going to be string week and then the week number. Uh, no, it just says week. OK. I'm going to call this not data, but state. These are words that I made up, uh, I use in my daily work. So we call, like the main store is the store, that's the mutable thing that contains the data. And the thing that's inside it, the, the, the snapshot, that's the state. And then the components work on just uh, UI data of some sort. OK, so this function now receives the state and returns a title. And then it says week something, and then there's no week because I have to get the week from the shopping list. So state, shopping, list, week. This is week 45. Let's get rid of that red color. Um, OK. And then I also, just to make it put some colors on screen, I prepared uh, another component that we can use, which is called a list icon. And we have to import it. And that looks like oh, <laughs> that's a very, very big list icon. Um, OK, I can theme it uh, to pink. And then we can put it inside something that makes it a little bit smaller. 64 pixels is about right. And then we can put some styles here. We can say display flex. 
uh, that should put them on side by side and then it's align something, items maybe, I don't know, center. And then we can put some margins on it. And you can see that the browser just keeps updating as I save my file. So previously I was going around um, evaluating a lot of code, but now I'm just saving file and having it auto update. So the good thing about the saving part is that it will evaluate all the code at once. But sometimes you only want to evaluate a little bit, but you have the option to choose which one fits any given situation. OK, uh, I put a mar margin. And then we want to space that header a little bit. So we'll give it a left margin as well. 20. OK, now we have a nice header. Then I'm going to create a, um, some more margins. 20. And then inside here, we will have our list. And OK, so now I can use, uh, I'm going to use a for loop, which loops through all the items of a collection. But then I have to have a collection which I don't at this point. So my prepare function needs to prepare more data. Items, it's a sufficiently uh, <laughs> meaningless term. So we'll grab the state shopping list groceries. And that's a list, if you remember, of things with text, which is sufficiently good for the UI. I, I just want to avoid mainly that I have uh, UI uh, or sorry domain concepts inside my UI uh, components because that really makes them not so reusable for different contexts. So I didn't finish the code here, and that's what the, the compiler is telling me over here. So we have um, I can destructure the text from the items in my UI data. Li text. This is going a little bit, oh, OK. I'm doing this quickly, but <laughs> my goal, as I said, is to give you the feel of this environment. So I don't want the items <laughs> in my flex uh, over here. So again, I'll create a div here, and I'll do slurp to move everything inside it. And I'll go into this one, and I can spit out the last element that I did not want in my header. And then I get it positioned here. OK. so. Now we're about to get to something interesting, because now I want to create my um, a, a, a input field where I can type new things to add to the list. And since this is a shopping list, I'll be typing the same things in here week after week. It would be very good to have some sort of uh, completion help, type completion, right? So I want to create a somewhat intelligent uh, thing at the top here that can complete things for me. So I'll create that as a separate component def component, uh, and I'll call it a completion input. And my first version of this is just going to be the input element with the input class. And then let's see, I can go, uh, we'll, OK, lots of margin 20, and then we'll put it here, completion input and some data. I don't know what the data is yet. That gives me an input. But it doesn't do anything. So let's think about the different cases we have for this. I, when there's nothing here, I want to have a placeholder of some sort. And then if there's text inside, I want the text to be brighter than the placeholder. And if you're typing and we have good suggestions, we want to display them somehow. That means that this UI control can have many visual states, but you can only ever see one at a time. So, to solve this problem, I will use a tool called DevCards, which looks like this. So I created one example up front, which just renders that list icon a bunch of times to test out different color palettes. So what this thing here does is it actually doesn't do a lot. It just enables you to render out a component many times with different data, so that you can see many versions in one go. It's kind of like unit tests for your uh, visual design, except they're not automated, because it's hard to automate visual properties. So I'll put this in a separate file for now. We'll call it a, a completion input. And then we're going to create, um, OK, require um, dum, dum core def component. And then DevCars is a separate library, but it's, it comes with built-in support for React components. So DumDum has a wrapper for it. 
that teaches it to understand its components. And it has a thing called def card. So the way it works is like this. You create uh, an example of using your components. So I can say basic input is looks like this. And now I will just have to put this on the list of available dev cards, which I have here. And then we'll go here. OK. So here we go. I have now have one example of using this component. Now uh, I can add some more examples. Let's say I want to have an input with placeholder. So that means that I'll pass in a placeholder, uh, type something. Basically, this is like test-driven development except for just the visual part of the wrap. So this looks exactly the same because I'm not really doing anything in this component here. So let's destructure the data that's coming in, and then we'll pass it on. And now I have a placeholder. OK, it looks good. Let's create another example uh, with value, perhaps. Value banana. And then it still just shows the placeholder because I'm not using the value for anything. Uh, I could also just pass the data down to the input, but I have a feeling that we'll not want to pass everything along. So, OK, banana, good. And then if I focus it, it looks a little bit different. I could have made a card that auto put auto automatically put the focus on, but you still have to have focus on the browser window. So it's not of that much help. But anyway, I've increased my, my bandwidth now, because I can see three versions of the component in one go. And I don't have to think about what my app is doing to create it. So let's hash out the completion bit. So now I want to have an input with a completion. So scratch the placeholder, and then I say completion. I need to have a partial word here. I have another word, uh, or. And then it says orange. So now I want this to kind of fill out in the back background. So that you can hit tab or whatever to complete it. Um, one way to do this is to render two separate input fields. So let's do that. So now we have a completion here, or rather, we may have a completion. So I'll create a wrapper element, and then I'll say when there is a completion, render another input. And its value will be the completion. OK, now I have two inputs. If I want them to look like they're completing each other, they need to be on top of each other. So let's put some relative positioning on the outer element. Uh, position, position, relative. And now if I do style position absolute on this one, something ridiculous is going to happen. So now my final element looks closer to what I want, but all the others collapsed. Because when this is absolutely positioned, then the div will collapse if it doesn't have any other content. So that means that I'm going to put this here, and then we're only going to do this when we have a completion. OK, so now you can see that in my completion card, the field is to the right here. So I want it to sit on top. And the way to do that is just to glue it to all the sides. And this is going to work because the two elements are the exact same element. And the div is now going to be shaped like this one. So if I position the other one to all the edges, it's going to perfectly overlap the underlying input. But now it's also covering it up, so I can't see it. But that can be easily fixed by setting the background on the top input field to transparent. And then boom, it looks like I have a suggestion, right? So this is just a visual part. I still have to figure out like where does the completions come from, and how do I get them into my app, and, and so on and so forth. But now I'm focusing on the front end bit. So I want to create one more example. 
and I want I want to see how this what this feel like if the suggestion is popping up as I type. So to do that, I will have a input with live completion. So if I pass a function instead of a component to this def card thing, then it's going to create an atom for me and pass it to the function. And I can read from the atom to render, and I can use an event handler to update the atom. And then dev cards will re-render the card. So, okay, I'll pick out the value from the store, and then we don't have any completions for now. And if I want, I can also feed it some initial data. So I could say the initial value is, uh, I don't know, uh, pizza. And then maybe we also need to have some completions to pick from later. So bandana, bazooka, and bajunga. OK. New card at the bottom, it renders with pizza because I said that was the initial value. But really, I want now, as I type, to update the store. So that means we need an event handler on input, which will receive an event. And then I can update the atom by calling swap, a search value, and I'll explain this in a moment, target value. OK, so this last thing here, dot dot, just means you know, perform operations on this thing. So this is the event, get the target, and get the value from that. And the other stuff here, swap, swaps out the contents of the store. And really, give, you can give it a function. It will pass the value into the function. And then you can do stuff with it. And then it has a shorthand for, <laughs> uh, let me just show you. Swap store fn state, assert state. So these two are the same. So this is just a uh, impenetrable shortcut if you don't know the language from before. But trust me, this does what it uh, says it does. So at least now, as I type, I should be able to update the text field because we're setting the value. Now I can choose a completion by looking at completions in store. And then I can filter them. So I'll pass the completions to filter. Completion, uh, screw that. We're going to do it inline. And then I'll say str starts with, and then this is the argument that's being passed to filter. And then this is the value. Mm. I'll try to save a little bit of space. Uh, OK, so if the completion starts with the string that I'm typing, um, and then I want the first one. So nothing happens. OK, we'll figure out why. Anyway, um, let's take a look at what's going on here. So we have our completions. And yeah, OK, so what's going on is that we have this input handler here that's not being used at all by our component. So nothing is going on. Um, so we need to take it in here and then just pass it along to the input field. And now I can try it again. We type, and then it suggests something. And now you kind of get the feeling of getting suggestions. And I immediately see that it's making suggestions when it's empty, which is not really good. But that's not inside the UI component, so it's not really that big of a problem. But I can do when not empty v. That way I don't get suggestions for empty text. OK, so now I have hashed out all the visual states of my component. I can go back to my application and render it. And then later, I can figure out where is this data going to come from? When will I have to contact the server to get it? That's a separate concern. Um, yeah, and then I need to comment something. Because now I'm putting what is basically a bunch of tests into my implementation. Would you do this in production? You could. And here's the reason. So def card here is a macro. And it has a uh, configuration option that you can flip when you compile. And if you turn it off, it just gets compiled right out. 
So you can compile for production and still keep the card in your source file. Or if you don't like it, you can put it in a separate file and just don't include it in the build at all. So that's it's a bit of, comes down to your uh, preferences, but for demonstration purposes, it's very helpful to have them in the same file. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's try and go uh, get back to our app, and then um, I don't need to have that here because we have created it in a separate file. And uh, we need some uh, parameters to send to it. Okay. And so here we need to prepare some data to pass to our completion input. So what will we pass? Well, I have a placeholder, uh, ingredient or whatever, grocery. Then I may have to update here. And then nothing is happening still because I'm not sending input UI data here. OK, so the placeholder now says ingredient. Just ignore that. Uh, but I now needed to update the current value so I know what the user is typing because we will need that to find good suggestions. And to do that, as you might remember from the card, I need to pass on input. But aha, uh -huh. I don't want to put a function inside my UI data. I want the UI data to be serializable, simple data because then I can I can get the data prepared directly from the server, or I can store it on disk and use it for uh, um, regression tests. You can do so much things if you just have pure data. So this function here really poisons the entire idea. So I don't want to do that. But luckily, I can put data on the event handler as well. If you do, you can tell DumDum how to dispatch events globally instead. So I'll say handle event here, and then it'll pass me the event and whatever data came from your event handler. So this allows me to bypass needing a function at this point, and I can get it down here instead. And then what we want to do is to handle action, is what I'm going to call this. And this function belongs close to my data, because actions are about manipulating the data we have in store. Event data, and my first implementation will just uh, print the action that's coming in. And then here, um, we have to figure out what is this going to look like. And DoomDom only passes this data through. It doesn't care what it is. You can put whatever you want in here. But I'm going to put a keyword that is the name of an action, which is to uh, save in store. And I want to save it in this key. And then, hmm. I would really like the value of the input field here. But I would have to get that from the event object, which I don't have access to here. OK. I don't, that's not possible. But I can put a placeholder. So I could say uh, event uh, target value. This is also just a keyword. The slasher just makes it a, a namespaced keyword. But right now, it's just a placeholder. So we'll have to figure out what to do with this later. If I save it now, um, we should be able to type here and then see the browser logging that it's, it's triggering this action, right? So at least we know that it's working. Um, in my handle action function, I have, um, again, the same thing that we did before. I have the value that you want. So let's see this again. The value is here, right? So I need to put it inside here somewhere. So I'm going to show you a very cool feature that ships, or that ships the standard library in Clojure uh, Script, which is called uh, walk, post walk. So you can pass a data and a function to it, and then it's going to call this function for every thing inside this data. It's just going to walk the whole tree and then give you each and every item from uh, it goes depth first, and then if uh, if you want, you can return something else from the function, and that will be replaced in the structure. So basically, if 
x is this keyword, then I want this value. Otherwise, I'll just take the x that was there from before. So now we can print this instead, and it should look a little bit more relevant. Um, so it says, save, and store, current, ban, um, ah, cool. So now I can access the value. And I did it all just completely data-driven. There's no functions in here, which makes me happy. OK. So let's say let action is this. And I probably still want to print it, just so we can see it for later. And then we can case on first action, which will be this keyword here. And then we can have, I can implement multiple kinds of actions eventually. And this one will be implemented using swap, just like we did before. Swap on the store that's up here. The store now becomes like, this become a global thing. I could have passed it into this function as well, but I'll let it pass for now. So what do I want to pass? I want to pass a search, and then I want the rest of the arguments from here. And I can do that by just doing apply and then doing rest action, which skips the first one and just gives you the rest as a list. OK. Oh, I deleted my logging feature. So how can we know if this is working? Well, I have two options. The first one is simply to just go into my comment block here. And then I can deref my store and just look at it. Yeah, looks like it's working. Pretty good. You could even do things like I could just look it up directly and yeah, work with it however I want. So the, this is very useful. But also, just being able to look at everything in the store is quite useful. So I'll introduce yet another library for this. This is more of a, a development tool that you typically wouldn't put in production code, but so it's called Gadget Inspector. And as the name implies, it inspects stuff. So in our boot up sequence to the bottom here, we'll call Gadget Inspect Store and just pass it to Store. Now, this library has a companion browser extension that I can find over here. Gadget. And uh, I'm sorry, this text is very tiny. I'm not sure I can, yeah, it doesn't really respond to my keyboard either. But trust me, you can see the data in here if you're close to, enough to the screen. And not only can you see, but you can click around and navigate into the data. And this handles all kinds of data, and it's very easy to, um, you can add uh, code to let it navigate your custom data structures and, and whatever you want. So having this up on the side is very useful. But we can make it even more useful if we do it one more time. So in here, we convert our store to UI data. I would be interested in having a look at what that looks like as well. So we can go here, and I can do um, UI data, and then like so. And then just before we render gadget, Inspect UI data. So now I have the store on top. I'm sorry this font is so small. And then I, you have UI data below. And now every time I type here, I can see how things are changing. So it gets live updated over here in the store, but nothing's happening in the UI data. So that means that we have to go into this business logic here and put a value that reads the current from store. And then if we click input here, it still says value nil. Yes, because it's called state, not store. So now it says banana down here. Um, cool. So let's stick. Um, mm, 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 mm. OK, let's do this. I'll just do swap, uh, store, the search, and then completions. We'll put some completions into, 
into the store and it will take the ones from here. Sorry, but I don't have time to implement the full server fetch right now, so we'll just work with some test data. But now we can see over here, uh, or here, if you will, um, that we have some completions in the store now. So in my business logic here, we can look for a completion. Find completion. And then I'll pass in the completions that are in state and my current value. And find completion takes completions and value. And then we're just going to rob the code from our test here from before. So this is very simplistic, but hopefully you kind of get the point. OK, completions. So let's move this a little bit. And then if I type B, and now it's just banana to me. And then you can keep working on it, make it more intelligent. And this is just data. It's just data in, data out. You can write tests for it. You can do all sorts of things. And if you want to work on the UI sort of, uh, side of things, you can go over here and focus solely on the UI. So now you have this really nice workflow that's very, it's very interactive, and you have tight focus on your UI components, and you have tight focus on your business logic, and you can separate them very clearly. And even the actions that we talked about up here, like this one only puts stuff in the store, but other actions will inevitably be more involved, and then you can test them as well. So I just want to show you one more thing before I close up, and that's um, one more example of uh, such a dev card as we have here. And this one I created before I came. And for the items in the list, it would be very nice if you could use like swipe gestures to get rid of them. And that's um, something that's quite uh, <laughs> quite picky stuff to, uh, to create, because you have to put lots of uh, event handlers on it, and there's lots of tedious maths, and you got to find the right thresholds. Like you want, if you're going to swipe it, you don't want it to swipe too easily. You want it to swipe just right. So being able to just focus on the individual behaviors, like here, is just insanely useful. And not having to worry about my login session timing out or being in the right place in the app or whatever. And here we can just create all the ludicrous situations that you can imagine and see them all in one go. So you can see here, uh, uh, this one, for instance, can be dragged like uh, left and it can be, and it snaps and it can snap back. You can drag to the right, but you cannot drag it to the right and then to the left. Lots of like tiny details. It's really only about the visual part of the application. And then the final example, like here I have a, a big red one that covers the entire item. If I click it, you can see that it has a nice transition on it. And then we can put this under the draggable and make sure that when it hits a certain threshold, we can trigger the transition. And if you do that, it can look like this. So you can see that once it gets revealed, it kind of pops into view. And if I drag it out to the side, it goes away. And then it comes back so I can try it again. So you can keep iterating on it. So this kind of tight feedback is just incredibly useful. So yeah, so we didn't get so far in this app, but you know, it's 10 past 5. And, uh, Friday afternoon. Um, this is about what I have prepared. I hope you found it useful or at least inspiring in some way and want to give it a shot. Uh, it's great fun working with. So yeah, thank you for listening.